now. Good morning and welcome to um, the first of our series webinar, uh, Leadership Toolkit, that was developed by K-State Research and Extension and the Kansas Department of Commerce. And you can get this toolkit module presented locally by your friendly neighborhood commerce regional project manager. So um, here we are, volunteer development tips and tools uh, with Jamie Menon uh, through K-State Research and Extension Pride and Community Vitality. And I'm Jan Steen, also with K-State Research and Extension, Community Vitality. And we have joining us Nadine Sigel, who is um, sort of our expert uh, in community vitality through K-State uh, Research and Extension for generational differences. So I'll let her introduce herself real quick so you hear her voice. Yep, and this is Nadine Sigel with K-State Research and Extension Community Vitality. <laughs> Good morning. So here is what we're going to expect today. We're going to do the first module, uh, abbreviated volunteer recruitment and retention, talk about some generational differences and how to connect. All right, so first of all, um, let's talk about a little bit about what motivates volunteers uh, to volunteer in the first place. And uh, we're all going to talk a little bit later about volunteer um, you know if you have people um, who are retiring from volunteering maybe stepping back a little bit or people move away you're going to need to refill your cache of volunteers and uh, so we'll give you some ideas on how to do that um, the one thing I want to ask you to do is just think back um, to a time when you might have had a negative experience working with a team or a group uh, maybe you had an idea that no one cared to listen to um, Maybe you felt like that idea was dismissed or you were made fun of for even suggesting it or if you felt like you were looked over Maybe you felt like an outsider to the group or confused Maybe you were asked to join a group as a volunteer, but you were confused. You didn't know really what your role was These are feelings that new volunteers um, When they come into an organization, maybe that's been around for a while People might feel this, um, you know, things have been done for a certain way for a long period of time um, they may come in with a new idea and maybe they're told, well, we've, we've been doing it this way for 20 years where we tried that back in 1975 and it didn't work. So, you know, we're not going to do it again. Um, whether intentional or not, the behavior of a group um, towards newer volunteers um, can cause those volunteers to look for other opportunities to volunteer with other organizations. Um, or maybe they just wouldn't be as effective as, as they could be within your organization if they're confused, if they don't know what's expected of them. So it's a good idea to sit down with those volunteers, have job descriptions, maybe some training for the volunteers, talk to them about your history as, a, as an organization, um, your goals, your vision, um, and maybe some ideas that they might have uh, for your group and, and for the work that they're going to be doing. So there are different reasons people volunteer and um, Volunteering is an incredible, incredibly fulfilling and worthwhile experience for the community and the volunteer. All local pride projects are established by the locals. So that ensures that the time the volunteers spend with the projects will benefit the community in a sustainable manner. Um, the reasons to volunteer um, are up here on the screen right now. Um, I'll go through them just briefly. Recognition, um, there might be a volunteer who is volunteering for your pride group because Maybe they want a little recognition for themselves. Hey, I helped do this. But a lot of times they're seeking that recognition and, and visibility for the group that they're volunteering for. So they want that pride group to be recognized. They want that pride group to have visibility um, within the community. There are volunteers who um, volunteer because of power. Uh, they want to have influence over certain programs and policies within a group. Altruism, those volunteers seek to promote ideal community values, affiliation, um, the affiliation volunteers are, are really in it to, to network um, within the organization, to network um, the organization with other organizations seeking a connection and camaraderie. And achievement-oriented volunteers seek successful completion of specific projects. We're going to go through three of these. Um, I'd like to note that the volunteer recruitment and retention tip sheet that you have access to through that link that we've sent out will have more detailed information about um, all of these that I talked about on the previous slide. 
But um, when working with the achievement-oriented volunteers um, and, and any of the volunteers, there are different areas that they fit in very well within the organization. So achievement-oriented volunteers are good at direct client services. They're really the ones that you want to have face-to-face -face contact when you're looking for new volunteers and when you're looking for donations. They're great at public relations and fundraising. And these are the ones that you want to have help make those job descriptions for the volunteer positions. They're very helpful um, and adept at training new volunteers and assisting with support activities. Um, a couple of the support activities they're really good at are volunteer evaluations. Um, it's, it's very important that your volunteers have an opportunity to evaluate their performance and to see if they're, you know, if they're fitting well within the organization or the role that they're playing. Maybe they, they would be better trying something else within the organization. Maybe they would do a little bit better if they had some additional training and that would give them an opportunity to um, suggest uh, some assistance there. Uh, also project evaluations. If you put a fall festival on or um, you, know, you build a walking trail in your park, you want your volunteers input on how well that project went. Uh, is there a way that it could be done better next time? Or what was really good about that? Uh, evaluate about that project. So you want your volunteers involved with with project evaluations and the achievement oriented volunteers are, are great at making up those evaluations and helping to administer them. Power oriented volunteers are great at promoting funders. So if you have donors to your program, these these are the people that are going to be out on the street corner with a megaphone telling everyone how great your donors are. They're, they're really good at planning fundraising events, training, visiting other organizations, not just to network, but to find ideas of, of ways that they're doing things and bring those back uh, to your pride group. Um, they're great at making policies and procedures for financial activities within the organization. Um, these are the people that will make up your surveys, your community surveys to find out um, what the needs of your community are and also to gather information for upcoming events. All volunteers need to be made to feel like the work that they do, which is often professional tasks, um, is appreciated and important to the organization. But the power-oriented volunteers are especially sensitive to that. They, they're looking for that recognition. So make sure that uh, whenever you complete a project, um, whenever you look back on the year of projects that you've done, that, that you have that recognition for your volunteers. And finally, on this slide, uh, affiliated-oriented volunteers are really great advocates. These are the ones with the elevator speech that go out and tell the rest of the world how great your organization is. They're good at forming policies for the whole organization. They're really good at fundraising and recognition as well, and organizing political debates as a community service. Um, oftentimes, pride groups will uh, invite candidates into a town hall meeting so that they could have um, time to talk about their position on issues so they can answer questions from the population. Um, one note here though, um, we stress highly that um, the pride group does not take a political side, that you do not endorse a political party or a certain political position, uh, that you remain as neutral as possible because you have the, you have the chance of alienating half of your donors, half of your volunteers, half of your program participants um, who come to your events. And when it comes time to get that city council resolution so you can remain a pride group, if you endorse the opposite party of, of the, the ones that's in power at the moment, um, you might have some difficulty um, remaining a group if they don't like some of the positions you're taking. So um, make sure that you remain neutral at all costs. So um, we endorse using the ICITUR model, um, the process of identifying opportunities and job descriptions. Uh, selecting qualified volunteers, orientation of those volunteers um, to show what the expectations are, training, which is passing on knowledge, attitude, and skills, utilizing appropriate matches um, to the jobs uh, that are needed um, and the volunteers that you have, recognition of volunteers, and evaluating the performance of those volunteers in the organization. A little more description is on the tip sheet provided. So. Um, that's where the handouts that are associated with this part of the PowerPoint are important because um, you might ask yourself, how do you identify these, the types of um, volunteers that were listed earlier? Well, that would be that volunteer interest survey. Um, when you get a volunteer, give them the survey and see where their interests lie. Um, 
then if you have um, people who are in the organization already, you might have a self-evaluation for them uh, because sometimes there's um, confusion. Uh, having a plan of work or job description is important. Um, it allows people to know where they fit and what's expected. It's also good um, when rarely you have a difficult a volunteer situation. Sometimes it's just a clarification issue, but also it's an opportunity um, for you to reevaluate uh, the person in the role if that's the appropriate role for them. Um, succession management and ways to recognize um, your volunteers. And so I'll put a little plug in for our Rising Star Award through the Kansas Pride Program. It's a guaranteed plaque every year, uh, one per community to recognize a person, uh, an, an entity, business that might, youth uh, that might be um, doing exemplary work for your organization. So um, in closing this part, um, one way to um, find if you can uh, reach more people is to ask. A lot of people when they do exit surveys, um, they or are asked, well, why don't you, why didn't you volunteer for this? Well, I was never asked if I would like to volunteer. Uh, sometimes people leave organizations because of confusion. They don't know what their roles are. Um, and it, it just kind of gives them um, too much stress or they don't want to uh, be a part of the organization if that clarity is not there. And so also, um, like Jan mentioned before, if there is not a clear sense of worth to um, what they're doing, if they're not recognized or um, a thank you is not given uh, in any, any form, um, then that might cause them to pull back and not want to be a part of the organization. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. And this is the second part, uh, generational uh, differences. So um, the changing face of volunteerism, everyone is panicked because no one's coming to the meetings. So um, according to the July, August, 2017 Harvard business review, 50 years ago, people spent about 10 hours a week in meetings. Today, people spend on average 23 hours a week, and this does not include phone follow-ups and emails. They feel like meeting is a necessary evil to get through the work week. 65% of respondents find that meetings hinder work. 71% find that meetings are unproductive or inefficient, that's how they view it. And 62% feel that meeting prevents team building. So what does this mean? When people volunteer, they want to feel good and not like it's more work. So that might be an opportunity uh, to explore if you don't have people coming to the meetings. So how can this be remedied? Surveys can help you find where the interests lay and who might be interested in doing what projects. You might have your meeting goers and you also have your doers. So um, social media, uh, putting out emails, texts, newsletters, information on how to get involved, when, where, how. Um, sensitivity and flexibility to schedules, if you hear from them. Um, also, considerations like transportation or childcare. Do those things need to be provided to allow them to be participating in the conversation? Uh, can a sense of community bring them together, uh, like a community potluck, bring people out of the, the uh, woodwork to um, come together to be a part of your goal and success? So, how do we learn, how we are taught, and how learning was facilitated? Let's think about the way we've learned and classroom settings. So uh, many of us grew up, say, in a classroom where they faced the front and the teacher had all the, the answers. So how was learning facilitated? Through books and what they were told, an authority figure. So at this time in um, this learning style and generation, uh, real to real and tele television was just starting to be introduced into the classroom. So next, there are people that grew up in um, settings, school settings where they were engaged in small groups and learning together how to solve problems. So they worked independently, but also involved others to find the answer. So TV became more in the classroom and video learning was being introduced. So Nowadays, how, to, how do people learn? Um, teachers, of course, peers, books, videos, internet, phones. Um, why is that important? 
to consider. So baby boomers, um, they were brought up in traditional learning. So I take a step back, how we have learned influences how we engage or wish to be engaged. So baby boomers had traditional learning, they value teams, their abilities and recognition. So when you're recruiting uh, people of this generation, um, this, these are the things to keep in mind. Um, generation X, um, they value work-life balance. Um, they are looking for what they feel that they didn't get, uh, which was a lot of um, family time. And they focus on the value of their, their work. And when they're contributing, they want to see the value up front or while it's happening. So Generation Y or Millennials uh, were raised to work in groups. Um, and this is where you see a lot of um, group donating time or crowdfunding. Uh, they like to donate in groups and they like to no donate their time in groups. Um, there was an example of someone going out on social media, um, a youth going with her mother uh, to uh, help at a local uh, food bank and she put out there that that's what she was doing and if you want to join me and seven of her friends showed up. So uh, those are opportunities they use to spend time together as well. Uh, they don't see uh, disability or racial differences. They value digital space and they like new ideas and perspectives. So Generation Z, um, I have a little Z at home and um, they're socially conscious and philanthropic. Uh, they're ethnically diverse and they want to use technology to solve problems. And I'll give you an example. I, uh, my son wanted chicken tortilla soup and I didn't know how to make it. And so he went and popped on YouTube and um, got me a video to show me how. So um, they like to problem, problem solve using technology. So um, in the generational tip sheet uh, goes in more depth on how to engage. So we're gonna take a step back again and think about terms of division. When we do that, um, people naturally like to categorize things. And so we like to say avoid catchphrases when talking about groups of people because some phrases may cause people to pull away and not wanna be a part of your organization. There may be a participation trophy generation, but they were not the ones handing out the trophies, for example. Um, value people for their passion and commitment. So we're gonna focus on how we connect. So stop the us and them cycle and change it to us and we. And how we can do that, um, we're borrowing some uh, information from the uh, University of Ohio State University Generation Connection Information. Uh, which is provided on an, another tip sheet. So it's to change the mindset and become a generation of connection. Collaboration, community, computerization, content focus, and connection. It isn't about the generation that we come from, it's about the common interests that we share. So how do we maintain or create connection? Um, and this is also on the tip sheet. So self awareness. You have to acknowledge your community first. Know your strengths, preferences, resources, limitations. Know your why and make it visible. Self-regulation. So controlling and channeling events, moods, impulses. Uh, is there something to celebrate? Putting something like that together. Is there a reactionary instance? Is there an urgent need? Facilitating around that and being able to control those situations the best you can. So motivation, uh, make it clear that you're driving beyond expectations. Um, practicing empathy and social awareness, being aware of feelings, needs, and concerns of others. Ask yourself or ask others um, how you can help. And social skills, being able to manage relationships with others and induce desirable responses. So ask yourself, what am I trying to accomplish? Who can help me? How can I contribute to them and deepen our relationships? So that is called working out loud, bringing people together and combine conventional wisdom about relationships with technology to reach and engage people. A different approach to networking, starting with those three questions. So instead of working to get something, lead with generosity and invest in relationships that give you access to other people, 
knowledge and possibilities, allowing others to contribute. So thinking facilitative leadership, use your collective ability to adapt, solve your problems and improve your performance. Know that change is real, but it doesn't have to separate you from your community goals. Don't view generational differences as negative, just dig in and find how your work together can make a difference. And so creating a common language or discover it in your community to cr cross perceived boundaries. And so I'm giving the example of making a difference. In K-State Research and Extension, we've adopted making a difference and we have what's called making a difference report. So um, when we're filling out the report, of course it's a report and it's not something that you're wanting to do at the moment, but you can't help but smile because you're making a difference and you're putting that in and it kind of motivates you. So um, the more we use common terms, the closer we feel to one another. So think of how you feel when you hear the name of your local festival. It means different things to different people, depending on the roles, whether you're, you're making it happen or you're participating, but we all know the importance of it and how it makes us feel when we're seeing each other enjoying it. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about ideas on how you can find volunteers. You know, so oftentimes in, in pride groups and other organizations, it's the same five or 10 people that are doing everything all the time. So you wanna get those new volunteers in there um, that you know, appreciate what you're doing and, and wanna be a part of what you're doing and maybe they just don't know it yet. So um, first thing is the first impressions program. Um, that is a free program from K-State Research and Extension. If your community has not already participated in that, I would highly recommend it. Um, this is a secret shopper type of program where four to six people from one community uh, come to visit your community. They look at um, things like the downtown area, um, the streets, the schools, the housing, the amenities in town. Um, are there any events going on um, that are visible uh, in the future? They also look at the online presence of the community to see if, if it's easy to find information. Um, if you're a new resident, uh, if you're somebody who lives there, uh, is it easy to get in contact with the city and find information about the businesses there? And those volunteers write a report. We compile those reports together and we come and give a town hall meeting to your community. And while they're visiting your community, um, sometime in that time frame, you also go and visit their community and provide the same service to them. The nice thing about the town hall meeting when, when the community comes together to hear about what was found in the first impressions visit, what needs your community might have, what good things are happening in your community is the people who attend this meeting are people who care about your community. If they didn't care about it, they wouldn't show up in the first place. So they're there, they're in the audience. And this is a great opportunity as a pride group at the beginning or the end to stand up and say, we're formed, we exist to help address community needs. If you would like to help address any of these issues that are, that are um, shown in the report, come see us at the back of the room and uh, we'll tell you how to get involved. So that's a great way to engage potential volunteers that way. Um, another way is to partner with your local 4-H club. Uh, 48 hours of 4-H or other events uh, where 4-Hers are doing community work. 4-Hers uh, really do care about their communities and are often involved in leadership projects. Um, some communities have Kansas pride signs. Some do not. Um, some of the pride signs over the years have faded. So if you have a faded sign or if you're thinking of putting up um, signs, um, you, the faded signs can be replaced with the new signs if you don't have a sign already. Um, you might consider putting one up. These signs tell people in your community and people passing through the community that there is an active group here that is working on making the community a better place to live. So this announces to visitors and residents that there is activity going on and it might um, encourage some of them to seek out how they can help. If you want to place a sign on the right of way, we advise you contact your local Kansas Department of Transportation office just so it's placed in the right place. If you wanna put it somewhere else um, in the community that's not in the right of way, you can place it anywhere you like. Okay. So engaging the one and done volunteers. Um, I'll just give you an example of my life. I have three kids. 
Um, the three kids are involved in all kinds of activities. Um, sometimes I work in the evenings. Sometimes I work on weekends. It's difficult for me to say I can commit to a meeting every month and in Included with that meeting every month, I can also help with an event on a regular basis. I just can't all of the time. So I might be more of a one and done volunteer. If, if you know that somebody has a certain skill, if they have a certain talent, if maybe they have a piece of equipment um, that would help you get a, a certain project done, ask them if they would be willing to help for that one event. Um, and if they appreciate what you do in the community, um, they're more likely to say yes to the one event if they do not have to commit for the entire year of activities. So, uh, and oftentimes if, if they still can't, if they appreciate what you do in the community, they may say, you know what, I, I can't volunteer, but you know, here's $25 or $50 and, and they become a donor. So at least you get a little something out of it and the community benefits either way. Um, another option is to get in touch with your local Masonic Lodge. Um, the Kansas Masons are partners with the Kansas Pride Program. And on the local level in communities with lodges, or even if there's a community without a lodge, we can get you in touch with the nearest lodge. Um, that's a resource there for you. Um, Masons can be volunteers. They have skills. They have knowledge. Um, some Masonic Lodges even have access to local uh, small matching grants that, that might be able to help you with, with certain projects locally. So engage those Masonic Lodges. We have some Masonic Lodges um, in the state that even provide the meals before certain events. Um, they'll, they appreciate what the Pride Group does and they will serve a breakfast or a lunch to that, that Pride group, group of volunteers before they go out and, and do that project that they're doing for the community's benefit. Uh, another way you can get volunteers is you can engage current volunteers and potential volunteers through Facebook. Uh, if your pride group has a Facebook page or a Facebook group, um, that's great. But you can also boost posts for five to ten dollars, a Facebook ad talking about your upcoming project or your upcoming meeting date um, can reach thousands of people. Um, you could talk about your local pride group's accomplishments, the need for volunteers, and how to get in contact with you um, if somebody is interested in volunteering and when the next meeting is and where it's going to be held. Flyers and questionnaires at events. If you have a fall festival, if you have a movie night in the park, um, any type of event where people are going to attend, if you make a flyer uh, about the event, it could have a survey on the back. And you can invite people to fill out that survey and drop it off later uh, somewhere else during the event. Um, ask people. Were you aware of the pride group before you came to this event? Were you aware that the pride group was putting on this event? What could be better about your community? Would you be willing to volunteer or assist with events like this? Would you like to be a committee member? Um, make the flyers and handouts more personal with contact information and a name of a real person within the pride group that they, they can get in touch with either by email or by phone to ask questions and uh, you know, make sure that you let them know that there's no obligation um, on that flyer if they do give you your information, their information. Have some of your meetings in different locations. Um, oftentimes a pride group will meet in one specific location. Um, sometimes that's behind closed doors and, and people don't get to see you. So if you meet instead, maybe once or twice a year at a local restaurant, maybe in the park, city hall, at the library, somewhere where people can see you, uh, somewhere where there's more visibility than your normal location, this may draw attention to your group, especially if you're wearing similar clothing, like if your pride group has t-shirts or baseball caps, uh, people can associate you by those, those pieces of clothing. Press releases all the time. Um, before you do work on a project, before a project begins, when the project is complete, when there's a celebration, an award, when a grant is won, um, send these press, press releases to radio, television, newspaper, send pictures, talk about how many people helped or attended, how the project is going to benefit the community. Not all press releases are going to be published, but some of them will. And the more you send, the more your name is going to be in front of the media on a regular basis. Always mention in the releases a little bit about your local pride program, maybe how long you've been around, maybe some of the other projects that you've worked on, um, that volunteer opportunities exist, and when and where your next meeting will be. Also include contact information. 
And I talked about this just a, a minute ago with the meeting location, but if you wear matching shirts like bright colored blue shirts with the pride logo on it or certain baseball caps, whatever, whatever you want to do to identify yourself as a group. If you wear these pieces of clothing at an event, if you wear them when you're out in the park, uh, weeding the flower gardens or painting the fire hydrants, people are going to see that there's an organized group working to improve the community. And if they see you wearing these clothes as an organized group, they're going to maybe come up to you and say, hey, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about what you're doing. Um, if they see you doing these things and they also see your picture in the paper, they're definitely going to know that you're an organized group that's active in the community. And if you're doing things that they value, there's a great opportunity for them to come up and try to seek you out and find out ways that they can help. Okay, so that is it from our end on the slideshow. But we want to open this up for questions and answers, and you can feel free to type any of those into the chat box. We have our first question. Do we have to get an okay to use a Pride logo on shirts? Um, I'll, I'll feel that. And Jan, okay. you can add. Um, well, um, the only real okay I would say that you uh, would need is um, we have, uh, we will personalize a logo for your community. Uh, just so that way it has a similar look and feel for branding. Uh, but once you get it, you can use it for anything. I mean, you can put it on a t-shirt, you can put it on a, we've seen banners and flags and uh, cups and uh, magnets, uh, napkins, plates, everything. And so that's what it's there for, is for you to use. Um, but I mean, there are communities that have their own individualized logo because they partner with other entities. and. Um, I mean, we would like to be aware of it, but um, it's what you need to do uh, yeah. to get your name out there. Yeah, and we have those in formats that printers ask for. Uh, EPS, we even have the original, um, we should have the original uh, Adobe Illustrator files. So if you have any need for those logos, um, just let us know. Um, I just did one the other day for Arlington um, Community Pride, and uh, a lot of communities just say like Arlington Pride, but they wanted to have community in their name, so I added that extra line and, and made that for them, and uh, we would just email those out. It's got the K with the star swoosh on it, and then your name uh, underneath it. And um, I'll also say that um, we don't, Pride groups don't have to have Pride in their name. Um, that's fine. If you're already a community organization, and you've enrolled as a pride group, that's, that's perfectly okay. We have, um, for example, IOLA is a community improvement task force, um, but they also have pride in their name, but they already had an um, organization that they wanted to be their pride group and they wanted that as their name and that's fine. We have another community, Grow Nortonville. Um, that's what they want their name to be. It doesn't have to have pride in it. So, um, so it, it, it allows for flexibility in your, if you wanted to come in as an organization that's already existing, or if you want to have your own name entering. Okay, any, any other questions? And you can unmute yourselves if you would like uh, to answer verbally. When do volunteer group sizes get big enough to split into subgroups? I can take a, a swing at that one uh, because I have a particular group in mind that did that. We had a group that decided after 30 years they didn't want to have the, the structure that they had always had, which was a board and a chairperson. They still had that existing structure, but they decided to have a shared leadership role. And that board was about 20 people uh, and they split into subgroups of three to four people. And what happened then was it allowed people who weren't members to be volunteers for the groups as well. Um, because before it seemed like it was specific membership and only those 20 people could handle things. When they got to open up into subgroups, those subgroups started reaching out to other people and involving them with their tasks and um, bringing other people's skills in. So. Um, I've seen if you have that large of a group, um, I would suggest not 
breaking into subgroups of one person. <laughs> um, I say that because that one person would be tasked with, with all of that if they can't get other people to come around it. Um, I would suggest at the least two, and I've seen groups of four and five work really well together. Uh, Jan? No, I, I agree with that. And um, last night I was at a, a pride group organizational meeting and they were actually setting up committees instead of, of leadership. Um, we had 50 people there and uh, they're, they're setting up their committees as leadership committees. So they might have uh, three or four people on the administrative group instead of having a chairperson or a president. That way, if, if somebody has to move, if somebody gets sick, the other people in the group are able to take on that task with, with the committees. And, and they have a communications group for the secretary and for people writing press releases and writing for grants that work with the finance group. So, um, you know, the, that committee structure is, is pretty useful in, in cases where, where the group is large. Okay, other questions? And as always, we're, we're available by email at pride at ksu.edu if you think of anything after this that you would like to ask us. And if there are any questions right away, I'll open it up to Nadine just in case there's anything we didn't cover on generational differences that she might want to expand on. Well, I think you did a good job on covering things. Um, just one comment that I would make is that a lot of times when we start talking about generational differences, we get into that habit of putting a label on a certain subgroup or a group of people and we call, call everybody baby boomers, generation X, millennials or whatever. Um, what I would caution you as you're trying to recruit volunteers is not saying that, oh, we want to recruit more millennials, but refer to it more as a group of, we're trying to recruit more young adults. Um, because it seems like we kind of have gotten to the point where we're almost, I don't want to say placing blame, but they kind of feel like we're blaming them for all the issues that are going on with our communities because um, they aren't getting involved. And that doesn't help us to recruit them if we give them a quote name and then try to place blame on them. So yeah, that that's really good. Um, good point, Nadine. Um, one thing we have is we have a we have a Pride program overview uh, introduction pr presentation, and we do talk about youth volunteers uh, in that uh, briefly. And extension research across the country has shown that if you uh, if you engage youth volunteers, if they are involved in their community, if they think that their voice is heard, and if they're making a difference in their community with projects. Um, a lot of times they'll come back to that community. So if you're worried about the population of your community dwindling, um, that's a good way to make sure that at least some of the youth come back. Not all of them will, but when they don't, um, usually they'll be involved in the community they do end up in. Um, also, if young people are involved in community projects, it tends to cut down on vandalism because they don't want to tear up things that they've worked very hard on and their friends don't want to tear up things that their friends worked hard on. So if you don't already engage young people, high schoolers, middle schoolers, even younger, um, to, to bring in ideas into your pride group of, of things that they would like to see in the community and maybe to get their help on some projects that are already underway, um, definitely think about that. Great input. So are there any other questions? Well, if not, um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thank you for the great, great questions. Um, okay, I, we do have some questions. Um, okay, what is the most common pride project that is done across the state? Um, in my experience, it would have to be beautification projects. Um, something that um, revitalizes or, or um, changes a space. Um, it doesn't have to be the entire downtown. Um, it could be a park space, trail space. It's usually a beautification um, focus. And that's usually where a lot of them start 
when they do start. And that's why first impressions kind of brings that out. It'll, it, it, when that happens, um, people sometimes see the things that they've become complacent about, and that is a focus of what they want to begin turning around. And so uh, that's where I see a lot of it. Yeah, I think you're right on that with, with the physical improvements. Um, there are also events. Events are really popular. So pride groups will do fall festivals, 4th of July celebrations, parades, Easter egg hunts, Christmas tree lighting ceremonies, um, you know, all kinds of things to celebrate uh, spring, fall, whatever holiday happens to be coming up. And that brings people into the community and it brings the community together for something fun to do. Okay, you're welcome. All right, it looks like um, we don't have any more questions. Um, thank you all very much for participating and for um, your questions. It helps others. So um, we will be having another um, keep, keep in the loop with the newsletter. If you want more opportunities, um, we have webinars every month through December and we will be doing more next year. Um, focusing on some of this on the toolkit and then other opportunities that arise that are um, community issues or um, communities have identified as a focus they want to learn more about. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.